Introduction to Parallel AC RLC Circuits. Well, let's get started and see where the differences lie. First things first, resistance. We always start with the simplest first and then we work our way along. So resistance, R is equal to K factor A, L over A. It's a physical property. Ohm symbol, ohms is how it's measured. It is opposition to current flow and there is no difference between an AC and a DC circuit for this. We only have one property to worry about. Let's take a look at some of the parallel rules. Parallel rules for parallel circuits are straightforward. They are no different than in level one and when we were dealing with basic DC circuits. E total is equal to all of the other voltage drops within the circuit. They're all identical. I total would be the current value of each of the individual loads added together. R total can be calculated two different ways, either with fractions or with negative exponents. I prefer this way because it's easier for me to see in my calculator. And then finally, resistors consume power. And because of that, P1, P2, P3, these add together to give us the total power. If we were to then look at the equations that we would use in order to calculate these values, well, we've got I is equal to E over ohm. That's Ohm's law. Then we've got our power formula, E times I. Our power formula, again, I squared times the ohms. And E squared divided by the ohms would also give me the power. And it doesn't matter which of those three power formulas I choose to use. So with a 120 volt circuit, with one, two, three resistors in, and 20 ohms would be the resistance of each one, then the calculated values using this uh, series of equations and my parallel rules, I could work out our total is 6.66 ohms. It's gotta be less than the smallest resistor, and there's three 20 ohm resistors. Uh, the I total, I simply used Ohm's law. I is equal to E over ohm. What is the total voltage and the total ohms? And then finally, what's the current that would flow through one of the resistors? Well, 120 volt divided by 20 ohms, right? Individual values would render six amps. Okay, so let's see how this differs now when we go to a phasor diagram. This is a resistive AC parallel phasor diagram. Remember, in a phasor diagram that we have items that must be sketched in relation to a reference. What is the same in a parallel circuit? The item that's the same in a parallel circuit is the voltage. The voltage is the same, and that means that the voltage must be sketched on the zero degree reference line. Now the voltage that we're sketching is the total voltage. So this would be E total, 120 volt at zero degrees. And again here, right, there's 120 volt at 120 volt at zero degrees. And finally, the last one. I'm just gonna sketch it. I'm gonna say E total, 120 volt at zero degrees. Great, so now when we go to sketch in our values for this circuit, what are we actually recording that is different? Well, we're recording the current, the current value of the circuit and the individual values of current are what we wanna sketch. So here's the first resistor. We said this one had a current value of six amps. And because it's a resistive circuit, what do we say in phase means? There is zero degrees. Zero degrees of shifting between the voltages and the current. So that means R1, the first current, the value of current that we would see here, kind of hard to see, it's over top. This would be my six amps. So we say six amps which would be I, R1, six amps at zero degrees. The next one, same thing, it's six amps. I, R2, six amps at zero degrees. And the last one down here, same thing, because it's the same resistance value. 
IR3, six amps at zero degrees. Great. What we're doing with a phaser diagram and with these reference phasers is we are proving Kirchhoff's current law by adding them all together. And since they are all at exactly the same angle, we can sum those values together, but we could also use an HV table or we could use mode three on our calculators. So here is the sum of all of these values. We still have E total, which is 120 volt at zero degrees. That's the source value. And now in addition to that, all three of these, what would be the total current? Well, the total current for this is going to be each of these added together with an HV table, or since they're at the same angle, just a basic sum. So that means that the total current in the circuit would also be placed here on the horizontal. And since it's current, we know it's gonna be a closed arrow. And that means I total would be equal to 18 amps at zero degrees. So remember, in a resistive AC parallel circuit, there is no out of phase component or shifting of the values of voltage or current. They are in phase with one another, which means they are drawn both on the reference line. What is different between series and parallel? Well, parallel, the reference is now the voltage. It's no longer the current. Voltage of the source is the reference. All right, let's take a look at the next item that we have in a parallel RLC circuit, and it's one that has to do with coils. Inductance, so L, inductance is equal to, well, there's the formula to calculate inductance, and we said it's measured in Henry's. But in addition to that, what else do we have? Well, in addition to that, we have reactants. And reactants is in opposition to a change in current flow, and we measure that in an AC circuit in ohms. So that means that there must be some more formulas, which of course there is, but I want you to look at these and see if they're really any significantly different from what we just looked at with resistance. The parallel rules remain the same. The only major difference that you're gonna see here is that no longer are we calculating R, resistance, but now we're calculating XL inductive reactants. And then down here, we're not calculating P power, but we're calculating Q, reactive inductive power. So the rules remain consistent. The only difference is which type of item are we referring to? They're still ohms, right? So then how are we going to calculate these values? Well, the same way that we did before, Ohm's law still exists, it's Ohm's. We still have three formulas to calculate values of VARs. And if we had a 120 volt source on this circuit, one, two, three inductors, and each one being 20 ohms, our values continue to be an XL of 6.66 ohms total, a total current of just over 18 amps, depending on how you calculate it, and a current through each individual inductor of six amps. So how is this gonna be represented then on a phasor diagram? Well, let's take a look. Here is my phasor diagram for inductors, inductive AC parallel. All right, so first things first, what do we have as a reference? We have the voltage, remember? Voltage is always the reference. So here's my voltage phaser, E total, 120 volts at zero degrees. E total, 120 volts at zero degrees, and E total, 120 volt at zero degrees. Now we also have a voltage down here, which would be our source voltage. This is gonna be the combined values of all of them, right? So this is E total is equal to 120 volt at zero degrees. 
All right, now we have a out of phase circuit. An out of phase circuit means that there must be a shift between the voltage and the current. Notice what I've sketched down here. It is exactly the same, the same data, the same information that we looked at when we were doing a series RLC circuit. You can go back and take a look if you want. I'll wait. Do, 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 do. Okay, we're back. So you checked and you're like, yeah, for sure. It is exactly the same. The current and the voltage are 90 degrees out of phase and the current will still lag the voltage. So how does this change things? Well, if the current still lags the voltage, that means that the currents that we are going to sketch onto this phasor diagram for inductive components will no longer be going vertical, will they? They can't be, because that would be leading, the current leading the voltage, which is not what an inductive circuit is. The current always lags the voltage in an inductive circuit. Since the reference has changed, that means that the current value now for an inductor is sketched on the bottom down here. So this would be I of the first inductor, which was six amps, and it's now at 270 degrees. Second one, same thing. We've got I of the second inductor, six amps at 270 degrees. And finally, if you haven't seen a pattern already, we got bigger issues afoot. So I, L3, six amps at 270 degrees. All right, so now we have all of these values sketched. The current is lagging the voltage. That's what we want to see with an inductive circuit. And that means that now the total value of current, and I'm not gonna be sketching this to scale, but the total value of current would be all of those added together to give us a total value I total equaling 18 amps at 270 degrees. So you can see there is a lot of similarities between an AC series and an AC parallel inductive circuit, but there is one major difference. The difference has to do with the reference. The reference has changed, and because the reference has changed, that means this where I place my inductive current will also change. So we utilize this in determining the direction of our triangles, right? Our direction of our triangles is gonna be utilized for this. So let's take a look at the next item. What else do we then have in a RLC circuit? Well, the, the last component that we run into here, of course, is capacitance. So here is my capacitance value or information. Uh, C capacitance is equal to my EA over DI, which was our plate area, the dielectric distance. It's sketched like this, measured in farads with an F. And obviously in an AC circuit, it reacts different. And so we record that with XC being ohms, right? Opposition to a change in voltage, of course it is. And if we were to look at parallel rules, look, holy smokes, they are yet the same again. So remember, in a parallel circuit, voltages are the same. The current value is all of them added together. And this, we're now calculating ohms. Ohms of capacitive reactance. Q total, well, Q total is my VARs of capacitive reactive energy. What additional equations then do we have that we can use to calculate these values? Well, I'm glad you asked. They are the same ones yet again that we have worked with for quite some time now. I is equal to E over Ohm for Ohm's law. Q, that would be the VARs of capacitive rea uh, reactive energy or power. And I squared times Ohm's. E squared times ohms. Which ohms are we calculating from? Well, the ohms of capacitive reactants, right? Capacitive reactants, capacitive reactants. 
So 120 volt source, one, two, three capacitors, 20 ohms a piece, which would mean XC total is 6.66 ohms, I total is 18.01 amps, and I of one capacitor would be equivalent to six amps. Six amps. All right, so let's take a look at how that will be represented on our phasor diagram. Our phasor diagram looks like this. We still have our source voltage. Remember, the reference is now the voltage. And we have the voltage at zero degrees. I'll sketch the last one here. E total is 120 volts at zero degrees. Down here is our totals. E total is equal to 120 volt at zero degrees. Excellent. And now where do our individual current values get sketched? The current values, remember, we're dealing with an out of phase component and those components have a 90 degree phase shift. The phase shift is due to the charging and the discharging of the plates, which is at this point not crazy important. What we need to remember is this, the current will lead the voltage. Whenever we have a capacitive component, it doesn't matter if it's in a series or in a parallel circuit, the current will lead the voltage. If the current leads the voltage, that means that where it's sketched on the phasor diagram will have changed from a series circuit. And so now if I want the current to lead, that means it needs to be sketched up here. So now all of our capacitive currents are at precisely 90 degrees, right? So this is I of my first capacitor, which is six amps at 90 degrees. Here's my second capacitor. IC2 is equal to six amps at 90 degrees. And finally, the last one. IC3, six amps at 90 degrees, which means that the total of this three different current values. To prove Kirchhoff's current law, we could, because they're at exactly the same angle, we could just add them together. Or what we could do is use an HV table to add the currents. Or what we could do is use our mode three. Either uh, of those would work just fine. But the end result is this. We end up with our total current, I total, equaling 18 amps at 90 degrees. So in a parallel RLC circuit, what do we have? We have resistors, inductors, and capacitors. But now the main difference is where they are sketched, okay? So just as a review, where is the source voltage? Right here. E total is the source at zero degrees. The current values that we would see for a capacitor, capacitive currents, I capacitors is always going to be at 90 degrees. I of an inductor, and we'll put a little caveat on that. We'll say I of an inductor, and we'll put in brackets pure inductor, right, with no resistance, would be at 270 degrees. And I of our resistors continues to be at zero degrees. When we want to know the total current value, I total, I total is calculated in these circuits by using a, a number of different methods as we've seen in the previous topic of series RLC. I total 
is going to use, if we just had the current values here, an HV table, we could use mode three of our calculator. We can't simply just add them, right? But are there other ways we can come to this answer? Yeah, for sure. Isn't I total also equal to, I don't know, couldn't we get I is equal to the total voltage divided by the total impedance and I total could be the total, I don't know, S divided by the total voltage. I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of different methods that we could come to the same answer, isn't there? And so that is the key that we see continually uh, with all of the different calculations that we do with RLC circuits. There are numerous methods to get to the same value, right? The same value. So finally, just as a uh, last uh, item here, I'm just gonna sketch in a final phaser. And this final phaser I'm sketching, I'm gonna say this is I of a coil. And I of a coil is always going to be something that has both resistance and inductance. And uh, I'm gonna say it's always gonna be between, if it's one of these coils with resistance and inductance, between zero and, oops, 270 degrees. That's always where your coil uh, current's gonna be if it has resistance and it has inductance, somewhere in between this vertical and the horizontal. All right, so final item, what about power factors? What's gonna happen with power factors? Well, power factors are going to continue to remain the same calculation process, okay? The calculation for power factor will continue to rely upon our understanding of the uh, horizontal and the vertical components. So if we were to briefly look at what we have for power factor in parallel circuits, when we're dealing with a R circuit, resistive, a resistive circuit is going to have uh, a vertical or a horizontal appearing power triangle, and the S and the P will be equal. So we'll say S equals P. And what that means is that the power factor would be one. In an inductive AC circuit, the power triangle looks vertical and that's because there is only Q and S. So S is equal to Q and it's Q inductive. And that means when we do our calculation, because there is no horizontal, remember power factor is equal to the horizontal divided by the hypotenuse. The power factor would then end up being zero. Now, how would we distinguish this power factor of zero? Because we know that over here, with a capacitive circuit, we are also gonna get a power factor of zero. And that's right, we are gonna get a zero lag, right, lag. So the way in which we refer to the power factor is still the same. So finally, S, Q, S, C is identical, right? So S is equal to Q, C. And that means we have a power factor of zero lead. So there are a significant number of factors that are the same between series and parallel. One of the more important items is that impedance calculations in parallel will be a little bit different. So make sure to take a look at that video lecture that we have on calculating impedance in a parallel circuit.